What is up, theology nerds? This is Trip, and you're listening to the Homebrewed Christianity Podcast. That's right. This is the theology podcast, and we interview people who will serve as your audiological ingredients as you brew your own faith. That's right. We don't want to think for you. We want to think with you. Oh, yeah. And today on the podcast, we have Amy Brown Hughes, who is the co-author with Lynn of amazing book, Christian Women in the Patristic World, Their Influence, Authority, Legacy in the 2nd through 5th Centuries. Now, Amy and I got on the phone, and by that I meant Zoom, which is an app. It's like a Skype with better audio. We got on Zoom. We started talking for quite a bit, and then we realized that we should start the interview. And there was so much content because we got sidetracked on Origen, the early church father, Yep, the early church father who said, Obviously, an infinite God of love in a finite world is full of brokenness. Most of it will be redeemed, but could Satan even be redeemed? That early church father, Origen, who may or may not have taken literally the Bible passage, Blessed are those who make themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of God. Ouch! Nonetheless, our shared love of Origen got us distracted. We had a long conversation that eventually got around to talking about this book. But the book is so good. Christian women in the patristic world. And I just want to, on top of just like saying, like, oh, I enjoyed reading the book and interviewing her. um, This book is nine chapters that each focus on different characters in the second to fifth century. And when it looks at them, you will get, Uh, Not just an introduction to these nine characters, but you'll get a broad picture of the different roles and places and, 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 and situations that female leaders of the church in the second through fifth centuries played. And you'll find heroes uh, to tell people about the church right now is totally missing out on getting to tell the stories of some of these amazing early church leaders. So if you are a father like me and you got sons and daughters, I got two sons, one daughter, then this is an amazing book because I can tell Elgin, Cora, and Haven about some powerful, influential, passionate, compassionate, inspiring women in the patristic world so that all those early church fathers you find out they have sidekicks and maybe people ahead of them, maybe people that are pushing them to become more awesome, more zesty than they would be alone. Because, you know, patriarchy sucks. It does. And this book, I, like on top of like just the enjoyment of learning more of their history, getting nerdy and all that stuff, is a contribution to us learning to get ears big enough to hear our history so it's rich enough to move past so many of the impasses we have. Also, you'll know why I'm looking forward to Amy coming back on the podcast because we had so much fun. All right? So I hope you enjoy this. And Amy is uh, an assistant professor of theology at Gordon College. She did her PhD at Wheaton. And Lynn, who is her friend and colleague who she wrote the book with, is a New Testament professor at Wheaton College that she met, you know, in her studies. And so you'll hear some about their friendship and relationship in this whole story. But uh, honestly, like, I'm just pumped to share this this episode. Before I jump into that, I want to give a shout out to Carrie. That's right, Carrie King, who recently joined the Homebrewed Christianity community. She went to homebrewedcommunity.com. She joined, new member, homebrewed community, and also Mark Graham. Mark Graham, Carrie King, boom, welcome. If you want to support the podcast, join all the excitement, you can go there. I also want to give a big, big, big invitation to Atlanta. That's right, Atlanta. On the 12th of February, which is similar to February, but somewhere I heard it pronounced or pronunciated because it's not the correct pronunciation. Of February, and it just sounded more amazing. But anyway, on the 12th of February, 
I'm going to be doing a live podcast with my friends at McAfee School of Theology, which is part of Mercer University in the ATL, the Atlanta, hot Atlanta, which isn't that hot in February. But I'll be there on the 12th at Historic Old Manny's Tavern. It's actually a free podcast, a free live podcast. So go on the Homebrewed Christianity Facebook site and you can RSVP, get all the info and stuff like that. It's going to be fun. On top of on top of the fact it's a free podcast, we are going to be talking about post-apocalyptic faith. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're going to be talking about zombies and Cylons, white walkers. You know what I mean? I know the nerds know what I mean. But nonetheless, we'll talk about other stuff too. But I'm personally excited that they were like, do you want to talk about post-apocalyptic pop culture stuff and theology? And I said, yes. Yes. Also, if you are in the Triangle area, that would be Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill on March 2nd. We're going to have a live podcast that evening in Chapel Hill, but all day that day. There's a one-day Theology Nerd Boot Camp with Jeffrey C. Pugh, uh, which is Religion and Science Literacy for church leaders. So that day we're going to talk about religion and science literacy so you can tackle and wrestle and lead and facilitate conversations around religion and science. That night we're going to have a live podcast in Chapel Hill. Then on April 18th, we're going to have a live podcast in Durham, North Carolina with Stanley Hauerwas and William Willimon. It's the anniversary of their book, Resident Aliens. And I'm I'm growing in grace in this 10th year of homebrewed Christianity, and I'm going to do a live podcast with Stanley Hauerwas. The Hauerwasian Mafia will be in the house and I'm going to talk to them. And my friends from the Crackers and Grape Juice podcast are going to be there, too. Uh, in May, on the 7th and 8th, I'm going to be in Minneapolis, Minnesota, or St. Paul. I know they're basically different cities, and everyone, it's a big deal there. It's kind of like Raleigh-Durham. They care, but I don't. But I'm going to be there, and I'm going to be there for the Religion and Science for Youth Ministers Conference in Science. Mike and I are going to have a tag team live podcast i hope it's competitive because i like competitive podcasts and i know tony jones is going to be there and so i figure that we will get to play au contraire mon frere and tony will come up with the questions and they'll be religion and science related and then science mike and i will have to like battle it out and because i know science mike is so nice and if you've never listened to science mike podcast you should but because i know he's so nice i'm confident i'll be able to win because I pick, I'm like I'm like Tom Brady in competitive theological podcasting. I just win, 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 win. You know what I mean? I mean, I've lost before, but I've been in the finals so many times <laughs> that, uh, and I'm committed to winning. That someone in their first competitive live podcasting environment, like Science Mike, who's also just generally nice and such, you know. I don't know what his Enneagram number is because I'm an eight and I don't think eights care about the Enneagram, but his number does care. And I know that. So I think I have an advantage. This is me talking junk science, Mike. I hope you can handle it. Anyway, don't put this on your calendar. And by that, I mean, put it on it because the homebrew Christianity 10th birthday party, boom, theology beer camp in August, the pre-event will be on the 15th and the 16th, 18th. It will happen. And it will happen in Asheville, North Carolina, but that's all you're getting out of me. All right? The 10th birthday for the Homebrewed Christianity Podcast. Or you could say Theology Beer Camp Birthday Edition is going down. Mm hmm. Amaze balls. It's like amazing, but you know how, like, a Cheeto, like a puffy Cheeto, is good, but a cheese ball is even better? Because you can toss them up and catch them in your mouth. That's what I'm talking about. That's how amazing it is. It's amaze balls, like cheese balls. Last but not least, <laughs> before we jump into the patristic world and look at some Christian women, leaders, theologians, ecclesiastical stewards, I want to say it's Lent. If you want to nerd out this Lent, you want to nerd out with your geek out this Lent? Then you, you should, uh, you should join Surviving the Bible. 
It's an online pop-up community. I'm doing my friends from the Homebrew Culture Cast, Christian and Amy Pyatt. We, look, people were saying after the Advent group, we had Make Advent Great Again, they said, we want to do something during Lent. And I'm like, yeah, it's a good idea. I don't know. What are we going to do? Blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, I don't know if I really want to do that. Well, it may have to be a good idea. Then Christian and Amy are like, let's, let's do something edgy. And I'm like, okay, I like edgy. Let's do something provocative. Uh, provocative. Let's do something where we build a community doing something we don't normally do all on our own. And I'm like, well, what's that? They said we're progressive Christians or uncomfortable reading the Bible. And I was like, <laughs> you're telling me? I, I, I don't even tell people if I had a quiet time, you know? It ruined my street cred. They're like, well, what if this Lent, we read the Bible every day during Lent. And we didn't just read it to be like, this is horrible. We were like, yeah, 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 let's assume all the criticism. Let's assume all the his, the history and things we know. Let's assume the bigger picture of the world that we have, that the people writing the text didn't have. Let's assume all that. But let's decide that we're going to wrestle with these texts and wrestle with them long enough to be blessed by them in some way. Even if that blessing is the permission and freedom to tell it, it's full of itself. Let's do that. And I was like, all right, surviving the Bible, this Lent, an online pop-up community is for doubters, for heretics, and even you, Bible-thumping faithful, can join. Because this is what we're going to do. We're going to gather online. Every day, we're going to be tackling different questions. The people sent in, when you join the group, you'll be asked, like, what kind of questions do you have about the Bible, about particular passages and stuff? And then every week, there'll be a live interactive video session that wrestles with a text for each week during Lent. And Argyle is to build a community of people who normally wouldn't actually choose to read the Bible every day. They used to, maybe, when they were growing up, but now there's like baggage connected to it. So let's decide to do it together, see what it's like, and decide to wrestle with it until it blesses us. Just like Jacob wrestled with the angel. He said, I'm not letting you go until you bless me. And the angel's like, that's good, I'll bless you, but I'll also bust your hip out and give you a new name and call you Israel. Now, I hope no one gets injured. (laughs) saying anyone should uh, expect to lose a hip or get a new name. It was a metaphor. It was the application of a story from Genesis about one of our Hebrew patriarchs. But not literally. But you get what I'm saying. We're going to wrestle with the text. And not just like deal with it to dismiss it or deal with it and affirm it and move on. We're going to wrestle with it in hopes for transformation. So if you want to join, go to Homebrewed Christianity. Go to our Facebook page. You can join there. Um, you can uh, go to survivingthebible.club because <laughs> club is an ending thing now for the internet. And I was like, oh, well, I'm going to buy that URL, survivingthebible.club. And you can join. Mm-hmm. All right. So here we go. This is one. Like nerdtastic, geekerific conversation with Amy Hughes, honor about Christian women in the patristic world. Want to give a shout out to all our friends at Baker Abbott Academic for sending the book. Enjoy Smoochie Boochies. All right. Hello, Homebrewed Christianity listeners. This is Trip, And today, Amy Brown Hughes is here to talk about her new book, Christian Women in the Patristic World, Their Influence, Authority, Legacy in the 2nd through 5th Centuries. And you may be saying to yourself, I don't know about that. 2nd through 5th Centuries, scary, scary already. Women hanging out with patristics, that's probably not going to go well. They might be spitting too much hate. But this book is awesome. It's exciting. And um, if you've said to yourself as a person of faith, as a minister, as a parent, that you want to be able to tell stories of powerful and passionate um, women of faith in the patristics, this is a great text to get. It's academic, except it's told in a very biographical approach. So uh, if you're a father to young daughters, you should have it and get some sweet art on the wall and learn to tell the stories. But now you get to meet Amy who we've been having a 30-minute discussion on origin, uh, so we're already excited. So thank you for being on, Amy. Oh, it is a pleasure to be here, Tripp. Thanks for having me. And uh, so 
um, one of the things that I, uh, what you were telling me a minute ago about this book is, uh, you know, you have a partner in crime, a co-author. And so this book was both the, the birth of a friendship between a historical theologian, you and a biblical scholar and, uh, a, a product of, of four years of work. So can you, can you tell us like, what was the moment, the, 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 the question that turned this text into, uh, something to really spend four years working on? Um, well, for me, I, I, at the beginning of the book, Lynn and I both um, share our particular experiences about what sort of prompted us specifically to think about women in early Christianity. Um, but for us, it was, I, I uh, participated in a class where I came in and talked to a senior seminar, I believe it was, about women and asceticism. Uh, Lynn and I really developed a friendship over... Uh, thinking about how these women really contributed to the development of Christianity. Not that they were just there and, oh, look, neat little stories. Mm -hmm. Um, But for me personally, it was, it's been the shape of my career in a lot of ways. I mentioned at the beginning of the book about um, a young woman who's a pastor's daughter, who I think she was about maybe 19 or 20 at the time. And her name is Sarah. And she came up to me um, after after or before church one day and said, um, Amy, I have a question to ask you. Um, now that I'm, you know, an adult, I'm pastor's daughter, you know, what is, and I'm single, you know, what is, what is my place in the church? Um, and I've told her since, you know, you really kind of sparked something that I, I decided that I knew that in early Christianity, we had access to a lot of women at very important time in Christianity where things were being decided, where creeds were being written, where monasteries were being built and, and political parties were shifting and changing and, and, and persecution was happening and all this stuff. Um, so I, I went there to see what are those stories um, and what, what influence did they actually have? What did they bring to the table and, and how can we, um, uh, sort of own that tradition and say, Hey, yeah, that's my relative in the faith. Mm-hmm. That's my sister, my grandmother, my mother in the faith. So why don't you, why don't, why do you think we don't know more of these stories? Well, I think there's lots of reasons. I think some of it is, um, as Protestants, I think there's always some questions about how we sort of embrace, um, the tradition between the closing of the canon and the reformation. Mm-hmm. Um, some questions about how, you know, how do we sort of encounter um, Catholic and Orthodox history? So I think there's that aspect of things. And because of those, I think we just don't, um, I think some of it is just, we, we just don't know how to process some of that some, from a tr- church tradition. But also um, I think that we, and also it's not, I think even also with the Catholic and Orthodox scholars uh, like stories around here, um, while feast days and talking about these saints is very popular, um, even like students and colleagues um, in those traditions um, don't necessarily include women in the larger conversation. So it's like, it, it's a little bit like <laughs> walking into a theologian's office and what you see on the wall is like, Oh, this is the theology section. And it's all like dudes. Um, Bard and Calvin and, you know, Ronner or, you know, whoever's up there. And then they might have another shelf that has women and it's like a separate shelf. So that's kind of what we've done to them is we've Mm -hmm. sort of seen them as not part of the story because we see this in, in historical tellings in general about any period in history that we tend towards great man history. Um, and we tend not to, um, dive deeper into sort of, uh, into other perspectives that might be there uh, for, and then I think there's lots of reasons for that. Um, and then I think we just get into a habit and then we don't know where to go because mm-hmm. nobody's written a book about it. We don't hear it preached about. I mean, there's been a good amount in biblical scholarship in the last uh, few couple decades, um, bringing women in, in the Bible back to the foray. And I think that that has brought some new interest going, well, they were in the Bible did they stop after <laughs> Did they stop serving Jesus after the Bible? Um, so I I'm excited to have written this book because um, I keep having people say to me like, thank you so much. Like I had no, I had no idea where to go for this, but it's been a desire. So we were thrilled to do that. So, so whose uh, story in the book uh, is the one you knew least <laughs> about 
and got to learn the most about why you were working on it? That would be my empresses. Uh, it's in the last chapter, uh, Pulcheria and Eudokia. Uh, it's a little bit later in history. I'm um, by training and and with my scholarship, I'm uh, a, trini- a Trinity and Christo- uh, Christological theologian. Mm-hmm. So I do a lot of work in the in the uh, fourth and very early fifth centuries, but third, fourth, and fifth centuries, and. Um, they're in the in the fifth century, but I hadn't really got into sort of beginning the early beginnings of Byzantium, um, and so that that was an absolute joy. And I, I just uh, I did not expect it to be as as marvelous as it was. I was more familiar with Polcaria, just because I um, working with the Council of Chalcedon and the Council of Ephesus, you mm-hmm. can't get a not talk about Polcaria. Although funny enough, I've noticed in some books talking about those councils. Somehow we're able not to talk about her, which is really surprising. Uh, so, but so, Eudokia, tell, have- so tell 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 us about her. Like a listener is sitting there, like, oh, I've sure. had to, I've had to I've had to say that creed at church, <laughs> right? So uh, Polcaria was the sister of of Theodosius II, um, who uh, presided over uh, the Council of Ephesus, not of Chalcedon. He died before that, but Polcaria was his sister and. And when their father, the great Theodosius I, died, um, it left uh, uh, an empire that was really sort of nervous because Theodosius, the only the, the son, the, the only heir to the throne as a, as a male heir, uh, I believe he was, I can't remember off the top of my head, I think he was like seven or eight. Like he was really young. And then Polcaria was the oldest. And I think she was maybe oh, 11, 12, somewhere in there. Um, and she just pretty much took it upon herself to say, well, I'm going to take over. <laughs> I'm going to train him to be an emperor. So he, it was like charm school for one for emperors. Like you're mm-hmm. going to walk this way, talk this way, do this, do that. And she basically became that in his life. Um, and then also in it and fired all of the people around who were trying to like power grab. And she hired some of her own staff. And then she declared, I am going to be a virgin. In other words, uh, <laughs> Uh, you can't marry me off. <laughs> I'm here to stay. And she sort of transitioned the palace into a, a, like a, a monastic retreat. Um, and so she took the, the bull by the horns here. And, and Theodosius was uh, a, a Christian historians and also uh, other historians have said he was, he was not the strong leader that his father was. He was, he tended to be, he wanted to write. He, he was more of a, a, a studious sort. And so Polcaria throughout his life um, spent a good amount of time um, managing him Mm -hmm. to make sure he didn't destroy the empire. Uh, One particular uh, bit, which I story, which I think is really amusing is after um, Eudokia, who's the second empress I mentioned, uh, Polcaria set up uh, Theodosius with, uh, with, um, with Eudokia as could be his wife. So it was their sister, like sister-in-laws. Um, and Polcaria, after she, he, her brother was married to Eudokia, um, she noticed that he was just sort of perfunctorily doing his work and not really paying attention. So she slipped into all of his uh, papers on his desk that he would sign with the imperial signature seal. Um, she slipped in there a note that, that basically stole Eudokia into slavery to see if he would sign it. And he did. <laughs> um, and she did it to catch him in it. Um, and then she showed back up, Theodosius, what were you thinking? You've got to pay attention. So she, she held that role um, and then got into, uh, she was also uh, very committed to um, the life of virginity and it being uh, her living into the role of being uh, into Christ's witness as a virgin. So her robe covered the altar in the church and uh, we fast forward to the moment when the when Theodosius was so taken in by this guy from Antioch, this bishop that he it was a very rigid, awesome biblical scholar who had a reputation for not liking heresy and being hard on heresy. Nestorius, and he brought in Nestorius, and um, Nestorius and Pulcheria did not get along. And uh, a particularly poignant moment was when Polcaria showed up to church to take the Eucharist. And she was very 
she was used to going around um, back with the priests to take the Eucharist there. Um, both the emperor and the empress did this, and it was custom. Uh, but she showed up, and Nestoria said, uh, no, you turn yourself back around and you walk out. You are not taking the Eucharist with the priest. So that 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 caused, caused some problems. Um, but Pulcheria was, was really important in the Council of Ephesus in, in working towards the Christological discussions that were happening there. Um, she was in a letter-writing campaign with Pope Leo to because... Uh, um, uh, it, for the Council of Chalcedon that would come later, and then with Cyril of Alexandria, um, it, it, with Nestorius. And so there was, uh, she was involved, not just peripherally, but fundamentally in making those two councils happen mm-hmm. and in addressing, uh, the theological, uh, discrepancies that she saw. Um, and then, uh, really working with the emperors to make sure uh, the emp- the empire remained unified as an imperial uh, leader. That was very important to her. And also that the church was in unity because if the church wasn't in unity, the empire wasn't in unity. So she was, she was an empress, full stop, but an empress who knew her Christology and pushed for it. So how would you describe the shift or the shifting role of of women and even the types of agency females had in the second to fifth century, you know, you, you move from martyrs all the way up to empress, that type of thing. How, Mm -hmm. how did the role of, uh, and power of women shift as the church's relationship with, uh, empire shifted? Oh, that's a big question. Um, so the, the big shift happened when, uh, when Constantine, of course, ended persecution on Christianity, um, and and Christianity became no longer a superstitio uh, or a superstition, but a protected religion. Now, Constantine did not uh, make Christianity the official religion of the empire. I, I hear that sometimes. He didn't do that. That wasn't until Theodosius the first. Um, but what he did do was carve out a very significant space for Christians to be a part of that. And so Christians were all of a sudden thrown into the situation where two things happened. One, they weren't sure if this was a blip on the screen. It could very well be that Constantine was a one hit wonder where he showed up and he was in power for two years and his bodyguard killed him. And that was that. And we went back to pagan Rome. So Christians were a little bit nervous about this. Uh, but I think that by the time the council of Nicaea showed up, it was pretty, it was pretty, uh, they, they were like, okay, well, this is going definitively in a different direction. Um, so Christians were able to sort of decide, okay, who are we now? Mm-hmm. Um, now that we aren't in hiding, now that we um, have freedom, now that we actually are a favored religion in the empire, what does that look like? And the big thing that they had to work through was how do we, how do we embrace and, and, um, continue the tradition of the martyrs. Mm-hmm. And what does it look like when we're no longer being martyred, but to have still have that same Christological encounter that we as Christians want to have sort of, we would say like a cruciform or a Christ shaped life. Uh, what does it look like to the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings when you're not actually being thrown in the arena anymore? Mm-hmm. And Women were, there were a lot of women martyrs and women were actually really fundamental to this shift because, um, it was, it was the women who started, um, I mean, there were also the desert fathers and stuff that would go out into the, into the deserts, but women would stay in the cities and they would live lives of death. So it, asceticism and these women who became what we would later call, um, Monk, nuns and such, but at that point, just living the ascetic life, mm-hmm. they were seeing themselves as consistent with two very important traditions. One, the martyr tradition, and two, the philosophical tradition in Christianity, um, where to live one's life in, in, in an ascetic way was to be committed to <laughs> one's particular philosophy or way of life. So this was, this was a, they wanted to remain connected to the apostolic and martyr tradition and also to, um, 
sort of see a way forward where where women were could participate in a developing church that was no longer um it was no longer in the same kind of danger mm -hmm. when when you are introducing uh, these type of uh, this this narrative of of church history and then in particular the female participation and such what are the biggest misconceptions you find in the church and in in the academy um well i think just on a on a very sort of base level it would be that oh women participated <laughs> Oh, and then the above that would be that women participated constructively and, and not so much in academia. I think there's enough out there now. And um, I'm very grateful for the work of a lot of women in specifically in my field of early Christianity, especially historians, um, Elizabeth Clark, um, uh, Susanna Elm. I mean, there's so many. I can just list tons of them who've done amazing work bringing text to life, um, Patricia Cox Miller, of bringing these texts and translating these texts into English, like a lot of these texts, like, and there's still several of them that aren't in English. Like I mentioned at the end of the book, uh, Eudokia's Sento, this mm -hmm. crazy piece where she takes lines from Homer um, and stitches it together to tell the story of the gospel. That's not translated in English. Uh, part of it is uh, in, in, you know, a dissertation here or there, but there's not an English translation of that. So some of it is just access uh, and, and, and scholarships are needing to catch up on, on doing a lot of that. And that work is really happening. Um, some of the problems I notice tend to be a little bit more in the systematic theology realm, where we're trying to tell the story of the development of Christianity and I don't know if we're trying to get to Bart or we're trying to get to <laughs> Calvin or we're trying, whoever we're trying to get to as we see the pinnacle of history is we sort of, um, you know, uh, look at early Christianity and go, here's a council, a council, and there's Augustine. And then we sort of skip forward. Um, so I think some of it is just um, an inattention to um the in a large scale how constructive the theology was in early christianity that there was a whole lot of work there that was that was happening that i think that is that is very constructive for theological like modern theological conversation right now a good example of this is actually gregory of nyssa he hit the work on him has exploded in the last let's say 15 years mm -hmm. because we found that especially some of his work on the doctrine of creation and, and theological anthropology has been very, um, has brought a very interesting and fresh voice to a lot of theological questions about the, the resurrection and about sexuality and gender. Um, and so some of it is just this misconception that what happened back there was the creeds and Constantine and a bunch of martyrs and then Augustine. <laughs> How, what role do you think the, uh, the tendency to summarize uh, the early church in ways as the product of men who come to power and keep power. And that's why they'll, depending on how critical of a take it is, but uh, you'll get to where the creeds canon and all these things are what the church does when it acts hyper masculine and is prioritizing male voices and that's also when they hated women the most and uh, this type of thing. Like I've the, the one of the things you, I saw in the book that does well is show that there is uh, it, the, in telling the bio, biographical narratives and kind of putting people in their historical context and reading them there, you can see the creative constructive ingenuity of women in within the Christian tradition in their, in their times. Yeah. And, the natural dismissive critique of the early church that more progressive theologians could ha take on behalf of women's voices today or something actually ends up silencing and ignoring um, the contributions that you're highlighting. Yeah. I, I, in a lot of ways, they're not wrong. I mean, Tertullian did say that, you know, a women's are the devil's gateway, right? Like, <laughs> so uh, there, there was very significant, um, not just obstacles for women, but a hostility in a lot of ways. Um, and, and there, but there's a, there's a, a complex story there uh, where 
we can tell the story of, of women, um, uh, of the suffering of women, of the silencing of women. We can certainly tell that story. And that is true. And, and we try to tell that because uh, I think it's really important. The fact that we have so little writing from women mm-hmm. with when even these women who were definitively ex- educated enough to do so, but it wasn't like the thing to do for women to write stuff down and to have public voices in the world. Part of the problem is the, the, the culture of the Roman empire mm-hmm. where um, when, when, when Cyprian of Carthage was looking at, Oh, we have a really a church that's growing and, and so how do we organize ourselves? You know, once we get beyond the house church stage and such, what, what do we do? And, and he looked at the organization that he knew the best, which was the way the Roman, the way the Romans organized themselves in society. So the structure of bishops and over specific areas and such, a lot of that comes from what they knew from their own culture. It, it would be similar to us, which we do, by the way, you know, structuring our churches like businesses, like where mm-hmm. we have trustees and all these different sorts of levels, right? So it's similar to that. But the problem with the, with perhaps with that culture and with the Roman culture is that um, women didn't really, uh, they had uh, a, a very, the roles that they had were very ill-defined. Um, and when they were defined, they tend to be very circumscribed. But then at other times it wasn't. So the Roman laws were changing too, where there mm-hmm. were changes in the marriage laws, where like some of the women in uh, one of the chapters, when I talk about Melania the Elder and Melania the Younger, who were like Warren Buffett like style rich, like even potentially more than that. Like they owned so much of the empire that millennia, the younger saying, yeah, I think my husband and I would like to move down. Like we'd like to sort of sell off all of our estates. And like, they met with the empress at the time who was like, please don't do that <laughs> because it would destabilize the economy mm-hmm. of the empire to do that at a time when they didn't want. So, uh, so, but so it wasn't that women didn't have any power in the Roman empire. Um, and, but Christians were ran into this sticky problem of how scripture was pretty clear that women were supposed to be a part of this. <laughs> uh, so they spent a good, like a lot of their letters, you see them trying to figure this out because in, 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 in Latin, you don't have like the, the word for courage. It, it just means male. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, so I, so when you hear Gregory of Nyssa saying, you know, I don't want to call Macarena a man, but I kind of need to, like, he's struggling. You hear them struggling with language and, and cultural mores to try to explain what it is that they were seeing in their mothers and their sisters and their friends and their colleagues. Um, and, and you see the limitations that they had, but also how the witness of who Christ is, which pushing them to stretch those boundaries and to break some of them. Mm-hmm. And they didn't always succeed. And so it is right to look at that and say, you know, we didn't always succeed. <laughs> um, and, and some men did some really uh, very restricting things on women and really shut a lot of things down. Um, and, and we need to look at that honestly and say, yes, that happened. But we also need to recognize that um, contextually things were happening and were changing. And there was some very important things that men and women did together. Uh, to to develop the church in a way where women did have a definitive role of participation, uh, even if it was negotiated, renegotiated, mm-hmm. uh, depending if you were in East or West, uh, that changed things because uh, different conversations were happening and happening around women, you know, with Jerome and and, and when they weren't happening necessarily in the East and, and with Gregory of Nyssa. So uh, we just need to be a little like the idea of a single story, right? We, there seems to be, we want to tell a single story about women. We want to tell a single story about theology and early Christianity. And we can't do that. And it's late as, as Christians. It's like, if we looked at our own family tree and said, well, yeah, you know, whatever happened back there, whatever. But we, we actually, by just sort of saying whatever and not caring about where we come from, we actually compromise our own de- identity. Mm-hmm. And the same is true here. If we, and, and we see this in women like Sarah who come up to me and have no recourse, like have no people to look at, um, that we have not been um, engaging with the tradition in such a way that is uh, that reflects how the church should operate. 
in the in the book you develop a concept called responsible remembering. Can you kind of de- can you describe that and how that uh, became a way of both reading and engaging Christian history and also thinking with a feminist lens? So I, I didn't actually come up with that. Neither did Lynn. That's Justo Gonzalez, mm-hmm. uh, the uh, historical theologian who he's written a lot. Um, and uh, that's from his book, Manana. Um, I think it's theology from Hispanic perspective or something along, I don't know the subtitle, but uh, he talks about theology as, as responsible remembrance and how mm-hmm. we, um, basically it, that, that looking at history it has a, uh, an advocacy function where we look back and we have to look ourselves in the mirror and say, this is what happened. Um, and we have to remember that well, and we can't just skip over things we don't like. Um, and we can't sort of shove things under the rug that we wish we didn't have to deal with. Um, and we also need to take the care to tell the stories of, of, um, that require us to enter into a bit more nuance. Like I had to, I had to learn a, more about what it meant to be a woman in uh, with an imperial uh, position, for instance, mm. because in the United States, as we say in, in, the, in the last chapter, like I, it was like in the West, we don't have a concept of empress. <laughs> I mean, we, we get, we get princesses. We're happy with that. Although, you know, how we understand princess, right? Like it's either Disney or, or uh, um, something like Princess Diana. Um, and uh, so we have that and Queen sort of associate only with either like the woman, the nice lady with corgis or like uh, the wicked queen from the, with a lot of power who's scary. And Empress, we just don't really have a concept of. We're like Queen Squared. Like, <laughs> we I mean, we, we don't know how to process women in that kind of authority. So I had to do my own work to take the time to read a lot, to, to work through what is it, what does that look like? And I found myself going, Hey, you know, we tell a very particular story of, of authority in the Western tradition, but in China, they've had empresses up (laughs) until the 20th century. So it, it, it's a lot about the stories we tell and responsible remembrance looks at like, we need to actually enter into the story and recognize that when we when we do so that we are elevating voices that we are um that we are uh, hopefully being a, an avenue for others to participate in the story of Christianity and to honor like the stories of people who've came before but to also look at that and go yeah we're 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 not going to we're not going to do that again we're we're going to we're going to learn from that Um, and we're going to look ourselves in the face and repent and to say, like, we were wrong. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think, so it's not just about that time period, right? It's, it's pretty much how as a historian and, and as a theologian, then I want to encounter stories in general, um, especially stories in cultures that we're not familiar with. It helps us to, uh, see history as, as sort of an exercise in empathy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what, um, when you're teaching this type of material to your students, what, Mm. what are you hoping they remember a year later? (laughs) Well, I am currently teaching it to my students, which is a lot of fun. Uh, I'm teaching a ancient medieval course right now. Um, so we've, we've talked about Thecla and Perpetua and Monica and, uh, Eudokia and all this. I, you know, what I hope for them is that they, is that they leave my class going, uh, like, and, and they've already told me that this is the case. Uh, one of my favorite comments I heard was, was, I just feel like history is bigger to me now. The story, the story holds more and it holds me differently mm-hmm. because, um, because this, the story is bigger than I thought. Um, and, and, you know, I love uh, for like telling the story of Thecla, for instance, I had them, uh, act out in like two minute skits of different sections of, of, of her story, which was unbelievably hilarious. Um, and they loved it. They loved sort of entering into the idea of, you know, lionesses laying down at the feet of Thecla and her, uh, baptizing herself in a pool of flesh eating seals. <laughs> they were like, yes. And I actually had a student dive in the trash can to like, I baptized myself. It was great. Um, 
but what they come out the other side is just feeling like that the that the church is for them that there's mm-hmm. that there's room for them whether uh, especially for the women in the class but also for the the men in my class have really felt like the church is is bigger than them they like that they like that there's that there's stories that they can enter into and and contributions that are bigger than them uh and it it helps them to uh to feel more connected to the body of Christ. Mm-hmm. So yeah. when, um, when you kind of look back at your own experience as a, a, a female person of faith in, in the church growing up and you talk about coming out of the charismatic movement, then going into the Academy and all that kind yeah. of stuff. Um, what parts of the way American, the American church uh, and American religion deals with the questions around women um, do you see roots in the past and um, what what ones do you think are, uh, I don't know, more unique to us or, or really things we need to get over sooner than later? Uh, <laughs> um, I think that as you know, I sort of I grew up with a, a very a wonderful mom and dad who uh, my mom actually after she raised four kids went to seminary. <laughs> and got her MDiv, which is super cool. And I've just been around uh, strong women in my life who um, have struggled to find where they can be, where they can be in the church in a way that isn't that doesn't limit their contribution. Like my mom is amazing with little kids mm-hmm. in a church. She's great at that. Um, she also is a beast. <laughs> when she speaks um, and is a very insightful theologian and, and, um, uh, and mentor. And, and I think about her and I think about so many women that I know who, and, and like in our, like the women who go through our Christian ministries department, who, uh, who are going to go out to the community where a lot of places they go, um, churches won't even look at them to consider them for a position. Um, and thankfully that's changing, um, but it's not changing as fast as we would like. <laughs> um, cause you know, here at Gordon, we, we have just these stunning young men and women who, um, we, we, we think can participate in all levels of, of, of ministry and we encourage them to do so and we train them to mm-hmm. do so. And I, I would really like to see uh, the, the question of women's full participation in ministry to be a done conversation. I mean, I, I, I will continue to have that conversation and, and I often will with students and such. Um, but for me as a theologian, it's, it's a finished conversation. <laughs> uh, so I, I would like us to sort of figure that out, uh, early to, because, um, we are, we're missing out on, on what it means for a woman to, uh, what sh- what women can offer to the church and we're, and we're shooting ourselves in the foot by not, by not doing that. So I would like to see that change. Um, I would also in general, I would like, I, I would like to see um, there's certain things that I think that we as, as people of faith in churches um, highlight that we should learn or, or engage in, in order to be, to be discipled as a Christian and uh, growing up, um, in the church, which I, which I loved. And I'm, you know, I'm still like in the charismatic tradition. It's still a tradition that I hold very dear. Mm-hmm. Um, I loved that the Holy spirit can use any of us at any time, at any place. Um, the Holy spirit is the great equalizer, right? The sort of Pentecostal thing. Um, but I think that we like, especially us women can sometimes tend to not say, Hey, theology is something that I could do. Like, I'm going to pick up this, this book on theology. I'm just going to pick up, like, um, this, you know, this, this book on systematic theology, or I'm not going to, there's a sense that, like, theology isn't for women. Um, and it is weird. I, I actually am the, uh, Wheaton's PhD program is, is still quite young. Um, so, but I am the first, uh, woman theologian to graduate from there. Um, and then, so women in theology is still, it's not as rare as it used to be, um, but it needs to become much less rare. And some of that is going to be on the church level where 
we encourage uh, young men and women um, and adult men and women <laughs> to engage in, in theological questions um, that like, oh, theology isn't just for the guys in the church. <laughs> And women just talk about insecurity all the time. Like, I mean, some of the ways we do like Bible studies, like even some of this very sort of very churchy sorts of things. Um, I've noticed that a lot of, uh, a lot of women assume sort of a a self-select themselves out for various reasons. And I don't blame them for that. I think it's the architecture of the church that kind of can do that sometimes. Uh, I'd like to see that, that I'd like to see um, the church get more comfortable with theology in general Mm -hmm. and with, our own history and um, and because I think stories are how we communicate with one another and how we grow. So I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> it, when, when you think of what the, what do you think the church in our contemporary situation needs to hear again from uh, uh, the patristics and this, Oof. this conversation that was very much alive that uh, is often experienced as dead. In the oh church. yeah, um, I think some of it is just what we think theology is. For them, theology was, uh, and the story of Christ was was everywhere with everyone, um, and it was a continuing conversation. They saw themselves as as directly connected with the apostolic and the martyr tradition, and and the ascetics saw themselves as connected with, with each other. You'll see in the book that there's a thread where Fe- we tell the story of Thecla right off the bat. But then she keeps coming up throughout the book uh, where um, Macarena's like sort of secret name when she was, when she was born was Thecla that Gregory of Nanzianzas goes and visits the, the Thecla shrine after he leaves Constantinople, after having a traumatic experience as the Bishop there during the council of Constantinople in 381. Um, he's like, I'm just going to go over to the shrine and write poetry. Um, so I think that uh, when we look at these 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 stories what we find is a church that that saw that death was just a sort of a minor thing that separates us from each other (laughs) um so what i would what i would hope for is is that we we see where we that we start telling our stories differently that we start telling where we come from and see that it is fundamental to who we are that it's like it's, it's like we're missing the introductory chapter to all of our lives and we can't do that. And then on a, so that's on a story level, then mm-hmm. on a theological level, the, the amount of, I, I heard a statistic, you know, this was just sort of off the cuff, but a colleague of mine a couple years ago said, you know, really what we're discussing now is like, it's like, 85% of theology was done in the first five centuries. And we're just now talking about the 15%. <laughs> um, and, and we keep talking about that 85%, but really so much of the construction of who we are as a church, who God is, who Christ is, what the Holy Spirit is, what it means to be baptized, what the Eucharist is, what the Bible is, all of that happened and there and continue. And we're constantly in dialogue with that tradition, even if we don't say yeah. we are, or even if we don't recognize it. So it would be helpful if we did, mm-hmm. if we, and, and when I teach my Christian theology class, everyone has to, it's the core class that everybody has to take here at Gordon. Um, I recommend certain early Christian theologians to read um, that would help them enter into that. Like Athanasius is on the incarnation mm-hmm. or Gregory of Nazianzus is theological orations. And I, I have in the past assigned like uh, Gregory of Nazianzus is um, uh, sermon uh, for the love of the poor. I think it's called. Yeah. And um, Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from Birmingham jail. I was like, you know what? I bet they're friends. Because <laughs> uh, this, this, how the, what's so remarkable is, is how consistent the Christian tradition is on a lot of things and how, how, what we can learn from each other. Um, and so I would really like to see us enter into that again and enter into and have some of those conversations again, the way I teach like the Trinity, for instance, is I tell the story. Mm -hmm. I tell the story of, and I bring the students along with me. These are the scriptures that they were engaging with. I said, yeah, Proverbs eight. That was a big conversation. They'll look at me with like squinty eyes, like Proverbs eight and the Trinity. I was like, yeah. So let's talk about why they saw that. And then they go, oh, maybe Arius, 
maybe areas I can kind of understand him. I'm like, right. <laughs> Uh, Because it's easy for us to look back and go, well, this is a done deal. But Mm -hmm. we ask the same questions. And uh, telling that story helps us to have an architecture to answer those questions for ourselves. Yeah. And I I think uh, when you get paid to teach Athanasius on the incarnation, it's cheating. Because (laughs) it's like one of the early church texts that if you have students that, you know, well, I, I teach divinity school so but um Mm -hmm. so they have some call or identification as a christian or or to ministry but um because it's in a progressive more mainline context the early church fathers are a giant mystery and probably responsible for most of the problems in the church Mm -hmm. and so i'm like yeah and the first thing you're going to read is is this and by the end you're all going to like him like i'm like my goal is you will think even if you disagree with him you're going to you're going to go like yeah, but his yeah. the 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 heart of Athanasius is such a uh a, a passionate yeah. commitment to like the, the embodied beauty of the gospel that right. And we can read Athanasius, we can read all of these people and 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 acknowledge like yeah, we got some issues yeah. because like you know, Augustine and I have a very uh we we have an interesting relationship in and you, I. Well, he he uh, his uh his relationship with most <laughs> Uh, with, with most yeah. theologians is complicated. That's his, uh, uh, well, and, and for me, you know, reading, uh, I got to, you know, reading those dialogues that I focus on with Monica in the book, uh, was really fun for me because it was an Augustine, an earlier Augustine, which I wasn't as familiar with. And, and he and I, we, we found some things we could talk about. <laughs> um, and I, you know, I, I, I've always appreciated him, but from the confessions and such, but, Wow, he and I diverge on some things quite strongly. And so, uh, but I, I feel like if we start, you know, especially talking about your context that you're in, seeing our conversations with the church instead of like, we don't look at the church fathers and say, oh, it's a done deal. What they says goes and then we move on. No, like it's a, con- like the great cloud of witnesses is still having a conversation with us. Yeah. So we can read Athanasius, we can read Augustine and go, yeah. Hmm. <laughs> and that's a tire- entirely appropriate. Um, but I, I mean, I hope that in 200 years, uh, if for some reason they read any of us, they roll their eyes at some of the assumptions that we made that they're like, why would you go? Like, look, you're sitting here. You're having a nice conversation on the Internet trying to get us to pay more attention to these female voices who are a part of the early church that we clearly pay more attention to now. And then y'all were completely ignorant of the fact that you assumed – Insert something that should go yeah. ahead and die. Like so part of uh, part, at least a challenge for me in more progressive context is going like you don't have a problem like saying your great grandfather if in the South, if you're white, was a racist and there was something beautiful about his life or his faith or, and, and co- contributes to your family. Like, you know how to negotiate the reality that all of us are thrown in the world and not don't pick where we are. And we're a, a giant collection of conundrums and contradictions and beauty and ugly. And yeah. part of responsible reception and reading uh, it, it, of your own family. Uh, if, if you ignore the ugliness, then it's going to continue to live in you. So you need to look at it, but you also need to realize there are strengths and things to be discovered that are positive. And Absolutely. I think too often we end up missing the ingenuity and creativity of a lot of the early church theologians when we don't engage them. Like Gregory of Nyssa describes a tr- all three persons of the Trinity using all female imagery. Mm-hmm. And um, he was not the only one. No, I know, but just like you, <laughs> I always like when you think of something like that, the all oh, the Trinity just it, you know just puts Father and Son <laughs> uh, locking in. You're like. Nah. Well, see, I, I tend, you know, I tend to be, I tend to be very gracious, especially with, um, with uh, the responses of, of, of women and those who are, are minority voices or marginalized voices in reading the text, because, you know, it's not fun for me as a woman to read, as a woman to read, you know, what Tertullian wrote or what mm-hmm. several of these, uh, you know, I, I, so I totally get it, yeah. and and um, and I and I hear that, and, and I and I and I agree. Um, and so some of this is, is, um, we need to read, we need to read this in order to have 
the conversation so that we as a church can look at ourselves honestly. Cause we need people who look at that and say, yeah, no, this isn't cool. And right. that, and that voice needs to be heard. Um, and that voice, uh, it needs to be, um, part of the conversation going forward because this, this church project is a continuing thing. Like we're, we're, we're all together sort of uh, like this, this church is marching forward. So um, as we participate in, in that with each other, I think um, uh, the voices that have particular, like when they read something and it goes, ah, like this is not something I want to see as, this is not what I want to receive as the Christian tradition. Like that, that's a really important prophetic voice. Mm -hmm. Uh, And, and in my field in patristics, I love it because my conference, I go to the North American patristic society every year in Chicago. And it's a, it's a blast because it's Catholics, Orthodox, mainline, um, some Jewish scholars, uh, and a bunch of people who are not people of faith. Um, and then there's a, a, a few sort of on the Protestant evangelical realm, and there's more that now than there definitely used to be. Mm-hmm. And when I go there, in our discipline, we've actually been really working through this. There's been some great scholars, I'm thinking of like Virginia Burris, who uh, was now at Syracuse, and a few others who have really like looked at this full in the face and have said some uncomfortable things that maybe some people in the church wish that, uh, we didn't have to deal with, but we, we need to. Um, so those voices, um, I, I always, I, I hear, I want to hear them and do hear them and think it's, and, and agree with them <laughs> in a lot of ways. But I, I also recognize that like, okay, you know, how can we, um, how can we receive the tradition, um, responsibly and also recognize that Athanasius's description of like, why, Jesus became, you know, why, why, why the incarnation happened? Why didn't he just show up at 33 and die of a disease? You know, why, like all these questions that he asked, like, that is so beautiful. And it's a way to enter into our tradition in a way that is like, it's, it's priceless. It's like, it's not repeatable. Mm-hmm. Uh, especially if you read the version that C.S. Lewis writes the introduction to it. I don't know if that's the one you read, but uh, you come away from that going, I want to read all the old books ever written. <laughs> Thank you, C.S. Lewis. Um, but yeah, so, uh, I, I, I always read those books. I always, and I write some of that myself because I think it's vital for the church, for the project of the church and for Mm -hmm. us as Christians. Awesome. Well, uh, the last question that pops in my head is how you as a scholar and also a person of faith have, uh, reframed or continued to ask that question you see in the fourth and fifth centuries of, how this the the martyr narratives continue to shape uh discipleship understandings of faithfulness uh when we're out of that context and also now more aware of the negative consequences um yeah. for those that lack power in uh valorizing submission yeah so there's been a good amount of work in feminist scholarship um specifically in christology mm-hmm. about thinking about the relationship between the father and the son and, um, and some, like uh, on some of the ends of, of thinking, what does it look like to, um, live into the life of Christ? If that life is like, uh, if that relationship between the father and the son is, is an abusive one or is, is one that is, that Christ is in this submissive role that where he takes on pain, um, and especially from if someone is from a, a marginalized people group, the last thing you want to hear in the gospel is like, enter into your pain. <laughs> I, like the suffering, the suffering is be- like, that's just how it rolls. Like you're being like Christ. Like <laughs> this is one of the reasons why liberation theology has been really important mm-hmm. for modern theology. Um, but I, one of the things um, in that specific conversation, um, I actually just, um, wrote a paper on this where Gregory of Nyssa, for instance, he wrote this little uh, treatise um, and the title is really complex, but basically (laughs) I I can't remember off the top of my head, but he's, I I know it in Latin. Um, (laughs) uh, What he talks about there is that, that scripture, I think it's in first Corinthians where Christ is submitted to the father Mm -hmm. Um, and Gregory goes through a very careful articulation biblically and theologically about how Christ doesn't submit in the way that humans submit. 
that Christ is not subordinate to the Father in the Trinity, and that him being a human, and uh, and he talks about sort of what it means for Christ to be fully human, and how we participate as humans in um, sort of in who Christ is, but but we don't sort of lean into uh, <laughs> this, like we don't go into it as a in a sort of a subordinate relationship way because we assume that 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 Christ has that relationship with the Father. So actually, um, that little treatise super helpful in mm-hmm. this conversation because the the early church was really really determined not to say that there was a hostile relationship between the father and the son like so um and some of this i think comes from our atonement theories uh mm-hmm. from uh like from the reformation on where the idea of the courtroom image where you have the father is the judge and then the son like steps in front of us and takes the wrath and the judgment of yeah. the father and while there's some like we can sort of structurally understand that in a way. Um, and, and yeah, that's an appropriate image sort of protected in some ways. Um, this idea of, of the potential separation between the father and the son and a problematic uh, sort of um, submission to suffering that, that assumes subordination, that this is your lot. Christ chose into it as a fully, fully God and fully human. Um, so his submission was that where he chose into it on our behalf. Um, this wasn't because the father forced him to do so and so, and, and, or any of that, but that relationship is not obvious. And so that's why we need, um, some of these early theologians who ask these questions, I think a lot more directly than sometimes we answer them today. Um, so in a lot of feminist literature currently, Gregory of Nyssa has been actually a really a good voice for this as well as, as others for, um, articulating that relationship in a more helpful manner so that you don't look at a woman and say, well, you know, because of your function as being, as suffering like Christ, then that means you're supposed to suffer in that relationship with your husband or mm-hmm. with your pastor or whatever. Like, no, <laughs> is <laughs> definitively not like the structure of, of what it means to be Christian. Cause, cause those martyrs, like the early Christians were really, really, really emphatic on how this was about one's agency that you chose mm-hmm. into uh, what was going to happen to you. Like, um, and, and you could, and you could be Christ-like without doing that. So the church spent a lot of time, like, do not run to be a martyr. You're not a better Christian. Like if you do this, in fact, speaking of origin earlier, like his mom actually hid all of his clothes. So he wouldn't run out and yeah. get martyred. So like, and that's just a function of like the church in general didn't want that to happen um, because, because martyrdom didn't mean you were a better Christian. Like if that was something that happened to you, then Christ was there with you and, and he was suffering with you and that then, and God would use that suffering, but run, but saying, seeing it as fundamentally like um, that, that is like, you just have to take it. Like, no, that was the big thing with the martyr stories that they always wanted to tell, especially with like Blandina, Mm -hmm. like, no, she, she, like the Romans couldn't, like, they couldn't torture her in a way that she actually would like be tortured. And the text, um, and the martyrs of Leanne and Vion talks about her being in the shape of a cross. And, and when everyone looked on her, they saw Christ. And the text is very specific there that Blandina isn't erased. Mm-hmm. but it's Blandina as Christ. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and that I think is really like that. We see what people, that the sufferings that people go through and we recognize that Christ is there. Um, but that, that is not constitutive yeah. of our, of the Trinitarian relationship, especially. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that makes sense. No, 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 <laughs> no. And, uh, I, if it's the part of this, I was thinking of it's, uh, when he's talking about first Corinthians 15, 20 to yes. 28, yes, uh, thank you. when he, he, he differentiates all things becoming subject to the sun are yep. these ontological realities that need destruction, like sin, law and death. But yes. when the son becomes subject to the father so that God may be all in all and the shift from father, son relationship to all things that participate, participate in the divine life is a way of going, 
Yeah, they, these things are being defeated so that all things mutually participate in divine life. Not what I love. I love that you know that text. And he also says that when Gregory also says there that when Christ is subjected, it's like us. He's tying. It's an ecclesiological term yeah. where we are the body of Christ. It is us that are being um, that are being brought to the that are being subjected. Like it's not Christ as the as the divine, but we as the body of Christ, and He goes before us in that. Um, but it does not eradicate the um, equality of the Father and the Son, or denigrate that relationship in in a sense so that it would become an abusive or problematic relationship in that way. And I also think that text is one to use when people are like, "Oh, well, the moment you have an optimistic eschatology, it just throws discipleship out the window." And you're like, this is like, no, like <laughs> to have this, to have this vision where God is all in all is yeah. to actually show us our responsibility and call to participate in the divine life in the present. And, yeah. And, and the, the, and I think that women, especially the women ascetics, like that's, uh, Macarena and Monica, especially Monica and Augustine with the beatific vision and that participation of what it looks like to, as who we are, as women, as men, as people of the 21st century, as, you know, as a woman in the fourth century, that what it looks like to participate because of who Christ is, that all of us, that Christ represents each one of us, mm -hmm. um, and that we are not a race in our particularity and in our context, um, but that God, that God um, invites all of us to the table. Awesome. Well, I've super enjoyed uh, talking with you. Well, Trip, it's been awesome. Thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. And uh, is there anywhere on the interwebs we should direct people to? Well, I am on Twitter <laughs> uh, at Amy Brown Hughes, so I'm there. Um, yeah, so I talk about uh, early Christianity. Um, I'm a bit of a sci-fi geek, so I talk about that too. Oh, um, well, then uh, now I know. Now I now we have a good reason to talk again. <laughs> Uh, I love sci science fiction and fantasy, big fan, and also on, on race and gender as well, because they're passionate areas of mine in theology. So so what was what was your kind of initial interest or what drew you into theological studies and uh, history? So my undergraduate is from Oral Roberts University in Tulsa, Oklahoma, because my tradition is Pentecostal charismatic. Well, and I would not have anticipated an Oral really? Roberts grad uh, writing this book. <laughs> oh, we, we live to surprise. Um, <laughs> so I, uh, it was actually in a, in a class there where one of the professors, I can't remember what class it was. I think it was just like a history of Christianity class. Um, he it brought up this group of women, the Montanists from like the first and second century, Priscilla and Maximilla. And we like mentioned them very briefly at the beginning of the book. They, um, didn't, they, were, they corrupted Tertullian. They're the w uh, corrupted. <laughs> full of, he got full of the Holy Ghost, and he did. And he stopped. Um, he stopped writing a very, very stringent theology. <laughs> yeah, and so we have these women who were who were prophesying and baptizing and doing all these crazy things, and and being in the charismatic movement, I went, wow. This looks familiar. This is OG, um, OG Pentecostals. Yes, yeah. So, and it was right in, it was in the 90s, like at the end of the 90s, right when the big sort of um, charismatic movement was really in full swing. And I was sort of right in the middle of that. Um, and so that really piqued my interest. And then um, after undergrad, um, I took a few years in between. I didn't know I wanted to go to grad school yet. But then when I did go to grad school, um, my cohort at Wheaton, uh, another, there was another guy there who was, um, also early Christianity and they didn't really have an early Christian theologian at that time. Mm -hmm. So we just sort of piecemealed. I did projects. It just kept interesting me and just being rooted in the faith was very interesting to me. And I was particularly fascinated by women in early Christianity. And so I, my third year there, uh, is when my, who would be my PhD advisor showed up, George Kalanis, who's a patristic scholar like mm -hmm. me. Uh, and he said, you need to do a thesis. And I said, okay. <laughs> uh, so I did mine on what it was like, uh, the difference between men writing about women in early Christianity and women writing about like uh, uh, women writing about uh, men writing about women and asceticism in early Christianity. And 
than what it was like for a woman to write about it from her perspective. And that would be Hildegard of Bingen from the medieval period. And so that was my thesis. And then he said, good thesis. You should apply for the PhD program. And then he and I worked together. So that's how, that's how it kind of happened. Awesome. So, yeah. so how did that whole trip into academia um, end up impacting your own faith and self-understanding of your faith? <sighs> Like what, if you get invited to go give a lecture on this book to Oral Roberts, uh, <laughs> what, what are you going to say? Like, here's where I've been and don't get too scared. Yeah. Um, well, they wouldn't be, you know, I've have, I still have some friends there, but, um, it's, oh, I would say that entering into that tradition and realizing that because there's this, there's this thing we do in Protestantism, some versions of Protestantism where we like to kind of like go, Hey, there was the Bible. And then there was nothing until my denomination. Oh yeah. <laughs> and, um, well, just not biblical Christians. There, yeah, there were not. some, there some were others. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so, and I, so when I first encountered and, when I first encountered some of these other people in early Christianity, I realized, um, first of all, that um, I was so grateful to kind of find like long lost relatives. Yeah. That's kind of the way I would feel it is like long lost relatives. And, and they weren't as, as weird as I thought they were going to be. Oh, they were weird, but they weren't as weird as I thought they were going to be. Um, and through reading that, and I started like reading, like actually reading the texts I found myself um, really finding a kinship, uh, especially within my tradition. So probably the the one that really impacted me the most was after I had decided that this was going to, what I was going to work on and everything was um, my first, first semester as a PhD student, I read origin of Alexandria's commentary on the song of songs. Oh, that's, that's dangerous. <laughs> um and it was so impactful for medieval Christianity yeah. and asceticism. And I was just like this. And I actually went to the library and I picked up um, like the anchor Bible commentary on song of songs, which is a great commentary. Um, I think it's Tremper Longman. Um, it's a great commentary, but I put the two of them side by side and I went, these are so different. <laughs> um, but when I read origins commentary, I like, it just, it, it got me in the gut. Uh, and I hadn't really had a biblical commentary do that to me before. Mm -hmm. Um, it always seemed very sort of informational, but not really about encounter. And so as the charismatic in me went, Ooh, um, so I think I've found that to be the case for me in pretty much all of these texts where reading Gregory of Nyssa's dialogue with his sister and just the openness and the beauty of that and the honesty of like, you know, what happens to our bodies when we die? You know, what is going to happen in the resurrection? And the relationships that I read between them, I, it really shaped my faith to feel like it had, <clears throat> it had grounding and his, history and depth and mm -hmm. story and beauty. So when, when you use that, uh, line about reading origins commentaries. Anything origin writes is somewhere between brilliant theology and like a theological mushroom trip. Because <laughs> like when he starts, like when he gives a commentary on the shape of the Ark of the Covenant, you know, there's like an excursus for ten pages, and and you're like, you got that out of a horn on the corner. And, but one of well, the, he would say to you, you didn't. Yeah, I know. There's this uh, <laughs> that that line you said about moving from. Uh, you normally read engagements with texts as information, and then in the uh, early church had a lot more. The text became the place or event of encounter. Yeah, um, and I wonder, like, how would you understand uh, both the role for the informational engagement with the text, but what's being lost and what's gained when we return to a place where theological conclusions weren't settled when texts were, were sacred, but not their interpretations are still open. And, uh, and just think of all the different ways origin can read a text is, uh, <laughs> the, he's a heretic and, uh, and Orthodox. And, uh, and he just kind of, uh, uh, blows the expectations up. If you go to any tribe today and go, here's what a good theologian does. Yeah, you know, there's a lot there. I, I think that um, what I love about in early Christianity <clears throat> is 
I just taught yesterday on the, like the formation of the biblical canon, Mm -hmm. how, even though it wasn't until Athanasius's Easter letter in the late fourth century that we have the canon sort of all put together uh, officially, it was, that was just merely mostly a stamp of approval. It was already really sort of together and even, even largely in the second century. So while Origen, it does seem like there was a bit of a wild west of biblical interpretation and, um, and theology, I, I, it, it wasn't quite as, as, as unstructured or as wild as it may seem. I think that Origen comes from a tradition of, of actually Jewish allegorical interpretation with Philo of Alexandria. So he's not doing anything com- like he didn't just wake up and go home. Oh, wow, I have a new way of reading scripture. My, the pizza I had last night told me this. Um, <laughs> so the, uh, so he's in, he's in a tradition, not only um, Jewish tradition with Philo, but also with Clement of Alexandria mm-hmm. as well. And so um, biblical commentary looked like that for quite some time. And I think that there's, there's an understanding of, of the text in this, in this early period, in the pre-modern period as being, um, uh, as, as, as being more heavily Christological in a way than we sort of encounter it now. And, and I don't, I don't mean to say that, oh, we should go back to the way Origen does commentaries. Although sometimes I think it might make things more interesting. Um, but he assumed that the text was, was of course not Christ, but that it, that as the sort of derivative witness to Christ, that it is infinite in its under, in our encounter with it, just like Christ is. Um, but yet it's tactile like Christ is. We can touch the words, we can touch the pages just as we can touch Christ's wounds, just as we can touch and eat with Christ, we can consume the words of the text. And so he just, he basically feasts on scripture and he talks about, uh, he thinks that you can't do prayer without scripture reading and that you can't do scripture reading without prayer. And I think that with all the things that he came up with and things that we might go, like, well, that's a little bit out there. I think that we can learn a good amount from his commitment to um, prayerful encounter with scripture and mm-hmm. with Christ in scripture that we expect to find that. And then, of course, some of the other people we look at in the book, um, Gregory of Nyssa is, is, is deeply influenced by Origen, even though he's going to adjust some of that theology post, post Nicaea. Um, and, and then going in the future, there are other theologians, Maximus Confessor, Vagris, uh, and many others that are going to be in that tradition. So, um, I probably just got off a little bit on there, but, <laughs> uh, but some of the, I mean, the church, the church didn't know what to do with Origen as seen by the fact that, is he heretic? Is he not? I mean, well, it, uh, hmm. uh, Benedict added a, an origin quote to some prayer hmm. manual, which meant he's like a little more legit. That's well, what and- Jesuit told me. I don't like, I, I'm like, is that how you <laughs> signal your softening on, on concern? Now, it doesn't mean well, his understanding of the Trinity. <laughs> Well, and it, well, his, under, his understanding of the Trinity is 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 pretty is actually not as is, is insane. He the um, subordination of the Son is not as as clear as I think some people read it to be. But uh, well, and on the Eastern side as well, I have some Eastern colleagues who would say, well, if we're really going to completely check out Origin, we might have to do that with Gregory of Nyssa too, and we're just not willing to do that. <laughs> yeah. So, and and this is a, it was a weird thing. The Church had never posthumously. Um, excommunicated and anathematized, well, anathematized someone. Um, and we haven't done it since. So the relationship with the, uh, to judge someone for something that they lived before um, is not generally how the church rolls. So um, this was a, that whole situation was, was a unique one. I just feel like when Origen wants us to ask seriously whether or not Satan gets saved, the assumptions in that are a lot more exciting than a lot of the assumptions that Tertullian has when he asks questions <laughs> to lose sleep over. Yeah. Um, so the, uh, uh, I, that's how I, I, in undergrad, I got assigned origin because who, what 18 year old has a favorite patristics <laughs> in a patristics class. And I was like, this guy's great. 
He's mm-hmm. he doesn't he doesn't care. And the on first principles book I liked quite a bit just because he's like this is obviously what all Christians think like God's love, freedom's genuine, and these mm-hmm. type of things. And uh, and then r- later the Reformation decided to uh, take back quite a few of just these foundational assumptions Origen had, and yeah. so. Just being well, able to quote it in class to irritate the Calvinist made me uh, like him. <laughs> well, he, you know, he's fun because the commitment to, if, if I could summarize it, God is simple and God is non-coercive. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, uh, and and he was committed to that. And so um, that the questions about Satan and the questions about the demons and such is, is largely him working out what does it look like for God not to compromise our agency? Uh, what does it look like for God not to coerce us? Uh, or, because he because he was writing primarily. I mean, there were several people who like ideas he was writing against, but determinism mm-hmm. was a big one. So, yeah. Well, we'll just uh, <laughs> the way excursus we, on origin section. The excursus <laughs> on origin called <laughs> vamping until it arrives. <laughs>